a more perfect union. Ephesians chapter 2. While you turn there, let me share a few things here. Uh, Alienation is a popular word in our society today. There are many people, there is a lot of people out there, especially young people in the so-called developed world who are delusioned with the system, critical of techno, techno, technocracy, that's what I was trying to say, and hostile to the establishment, who describe themselves as alienated, some work for reform, others plot revolution, others drop out. In no case can they accommodate themselves to the status quo. That was Karl Marx who popularized the word, having himself taken it from the German uh, theologian Ludwig Furbach. Marx understood the plight of the proletariat in terms of economic alienation. Every worker puts his craftsmanship as part of himself. When his employer then sells his product, he is guilty, at least in part, of alienating the worker from himself. This, according to Marx, was the basis of the class struggle. Nowadays, the word is used more generally of the working man's alienation, not only from his achievement and his due uh, and it, and his achievement and his due reward, but also from the exercise of power, especially decision-making. In other words, the term has become more political than economic. Alienation is partly a sense of dissatisfaction with what is, and partly a sense of powerlessness to change it. This is a widespread feeling in democratic countries of the West. And Christians would be foolish to ignore it. But long before Furbach and Marx, the Bible spoke of human alienation. It describes two other and even more radical alienations than the economic and political. One is alienation from our God and Creator, and the other alienation from one another, our fellow creatures. Nothing is more dehumanizing than this breakdown of fundamental human relationships. It is then that we become strangers in a world in which we should feel at home and aliens instead of citizens. Now in the second half of Ephesians chapter 2, human beings are depicted as alienated, again from each other. In particular, Gentiles, those who are not Jews, are described as alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. As I said, the first half of, well, in the first half of chapter 2, Paul traced the salvation of individual Gentile and Jews. Well, in today's section, he will advance to the abolition of their former differences, to their union in Christ, and to their formation into, their, into, the, into a, the church, a holy temple of the Lord. So what we're going to be seeing again is how our union, a believer's union, is a more perfect union, a believer's union with the Lord, with, because of Christ, the union that we have now with, with God, a more perfect union. All right, so before I read the first part of our passage, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us all here, for giving us your word to be able to read and hear and see, Lord. I pray now as we dig into it that you will speak powerfully to every person that's here, every person that's watching and listening to this message. Use me as your instrument to speak truth, to speak truth in love, Lord, and I pray that, again, it does its work, whether it's convict people of sin or to bring a new understanding or to remind people of things that maybe they have forgotten about. 
But we know your word is powerful and it can change lives, it can change hearts and relationships, Lord. We're so thankful that, again, you were here and that we're able to, to now sit at your feet and hear what you have to say. So protect us now as uh, we come together and dig into your word and, Lord, and, and fill this room with your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be picking up in verse 11. The word of God says, So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, but which, is, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I'll stop there. Paul begins this second half of this chapter by urging his Gentile readers to remember. To remember, to recall what they once were apart from Christ. Now, why do we need to be instructed to remember this? When we're told, we're not uh, told to remember the condition, our condition as dead in our transgression, transgressions and sins, as he says in the first verses of chapter 2. I, I think it's possible to understand why, and I'll share that with you now. See, we would like to forget that at once, at once, at one time we were as Gentile heathens. And in, many and in many ways, we, it's easy to forget those things, to forget that life. Not so with our former condition in our transgressions and sins. Now before, when we were dead in our sins, we, would, we were determined by the world. We were dominated by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now we still, as believers, we still battle these same three forces which wage war in our spiritual lives. Now there are a couple of reasons we can't forget. We can't forget because the struggle continues on. We can't forget what we cannot entirely leave behind. Now at the time when Paul wrote this, and even to this day, Jewish saints, those Messianic Jews today, and those who were living in Paul's time, who were proud of their heritage as Jews, they don't, you know, they're not the kind of people who want to forget who they were. They love their heritage. They love, you know, the history of where they came from. Many Gentile believers, who's you know, but it's different with Gentile believers, whose past brings nothing but feelings of shame and regret. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who can think back of those days when, before you gave your life to Christ, the person you were, the things you did, the decisions you made, the people you were involved with, it's easy, and it does. It brings, back, it brings feelings of shame and regret. But those Gentile, as Gentile believers, we're quick to blot out the past, to blot, blot the past out of our minds if we can. And so here, thus, they are challenged by Paul not to forget their past, but to remember it as they do so will be humbled and will be reminded anew of the wonder of God's grace, a grace that rescued out of the, out, 
rescue us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now in verses, these verses we read, the first two verses, 11 and 12, Paul describes the Gentiles' former condition from two very different perspectives. The first is from the point of view of the self-righteous Jew. The second is from the perspective of God himself and his word. Now, the first perspective is external. The second is internal. The first is physical. The second is spiritual. The first is inconsequential, while the second is of eternal significance. Self-righteous, self-righteous, Jew, uh, self-righteous Judaism tended to look only on the outside to judge according to external appearances rather than the essence of the matter. Judaism and the Judaizers, those who wished to place the yoke of Judaism on the necks of Gentile converts to faith in Christ, judged man on the basis of whether or not he was physically circumcised. To be circumcised was, in their minds, to be part of the covenant people, assured of divine blessing. And so to be, to be uncircumcised was to be a heathen destined for God's eternal wrath. Now elsewhere, Paul speaks about this matter of circumcision and its meaning. In Romans chapter 4, chapter 4 Paul reminded his readers that Abraham himself was not circumcised, uh, was not a circumcised man at a time he, regarded, he was regarded as a true believer by God. In the book of Galatians, Paul teaches that circumcision does not profit a Gentile convert and forbids Gentile believers to be circumcised. True circumcision, my friends, in the Old Testament and the New, is the circumcision of the heart. Look that up up in Deuteronomy chapter 10, chapter 30, and Colossians chapter 2. This here... This type of circumcision, the circumcision of the heart, is a circumcision which counts. The other, all it is is an external sign, which has no value apart, has no value apart from a genuine faith in God and obedience to his commands. The tone of Paul's words in verse 11 make it clear that the external distinctions of circumcision is the basis for the discrimination of Jews against Gentiles. Being uncircumcised to such Jews does not merely mean you're a Gentile, but you're a heathen. From a Jewish perspective, being uncircumcised is to be accursed because one isn't a Jew. This is, an accurate, this is not an accurate perception of the Ephesian saints' past. Paul describes the condition which Ephesian saints should remember in verse 12. Verse 12 sums up in Paul's terms, in Paul's term, terms what it means to be an unbelieving Gentile. Circumcision is not mentioned here. What is mentioned is the essence of the hope of a true Jew. What the Gentile saints are missing as unbelievers is what a true Jew, a true Old Testament saint, understood to be the blessings associated with Israel. I believe that Paul sums up the pathetic condition of unsaved Gentiles in the phrase, separate, separate from Christ. See, My friends, Christ is the son of David who will rule eternally as Israel's king. He was the lamb of God whom the prophet said would take away the sins of the world. He is 
the seed of Abraham, through whom the world will be blessed. He is the prophet like Moses, from whom Israel looked. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, he's even the rock which followed the Israelites in the wilderness. See, here's, here's the point. Here's what I'm saying, that he is the only way by which men, which all people, I'm just not men, but women, all people may be saved. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father th except through me. And after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, we're told in Acts chapter 4, verses 8 and 12, we're told this, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about good deeds done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. And here's the important part here. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And so here's my point. If being separated from Christ is the essence of, gen of, a gen of the Gentiles' pitiful condition, Paul fills in some additional details in the remainder of verse 12. As unbelieving Gentiles, the Ephesians were formerly alienated and excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. The presence of God was associated with Israel, the place, the actual location. Jacob, in Genesis uh, chapter 28, Jacob first realized this as he was about to leave this special place. Solomon later acknowledged the same truth in 1 Kings chapter 8. We're told of a story in 2 Kings chapter, 2 Kings chapter 5 in Isaiah 66 that when foreigners wish to worship and serve God, it must be on the soil. It must be on the soil of Israel. To be an Ephesian Gentile then was to be removed from the nation and the place where God showered blessings upon man. To be an unbelieving Gentile also meant that one was a stranger to the covenants of God, the covenants by which God promised to bless his people. And first and foremost, among these covenants was the Abrahamic covenant, which is described in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. But there, God purposed and promised to bless the nations of the earth. But this, bless, but this blessing was only through the seed of Abraham and only those who blessed him. Here's the thing, church. God called the Jews, beginning with Abraham, that through, through them he might reveal himself as the one true God. Lord Jesus was born a Jew. He was the offspring of Eve, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah, and the seed of David. And so to be a Gentile was to be a stranger to the covenants, to be a stranger to all these things. You were outside of these promises. You were outside of these blessings. If one is to be saved from his sins, he or she must believe in, in the Lord Jesus, who was a Jew, receiving God's salvation 
which is of the Jews. Well, the desperate condition of the, of the unsaved Gentile is now summed up by two phrases, without hope and without God in the world. Godless and hopeless. This is what we Gentiles are without faith in Christ. However, God has provided but one way for man's salvation and blessing. Like I mentioned earlier, the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, after this, after verse 12, Paul goes on to state the present union. The present union in verse 13. But now, in Christ, Jesus marks the contrast both temporarily, as he said in verse 11, as opposed to now, and uh, positionally, separate from Christ, he said in verse 12. The Gentiles, who were once far away from both God and the Jews, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. They have come near to God and to the Jews by means of Christ's sacrificial death. Sin separates people from God, and only Christ's atonement can remove that sin barrier. Now that Paul has stated the present union, he will go on to explain the union and what it involves, and explains what it involves. So let's go to our passage again and pick up in verse 14. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we, were, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. Now here, he discussed two things Two things in this section. The establishment of peace between Gentile and Jewish believers and the peace between God and the people who believe in him. But first, I want you to notice what Paul says there in verse 14. For he is our peace. Notice that he didn't say he made peace. Now, yes, that, of course, is true. And we'll see that in the next verse. But here, the fact is that he himself is our peace. But how can a person be peace? How can a person be peace? Well, church, my friends, this is how. When a Jew believes on the Lord Jesus, he loses his national identity. And then, and from then on, he is in Christ. Likewise, when a Gentile receives the Savior, he is no longer a Gentile. He's now in Christ. In other words, believing Jew and believing Gentile, once divided by enmity, are now both one in Christ. Now here's big thing about what I just said. It's very easy for people 
to classify themselves as something. I mean, everybody needs an identity, right? Everybody needs, you know, uh, everybody wants an identity. Everybody's looking for an identity. And, you know, whether it's by, you know, class or by race, ethnicity, um, be a number of things. First and foremost, before anything else, it's important for you to understand that you're a Christian, you're a believer, you're saved, you're a child of God, now born again, and you're one with Christ. So a Jew and a Gentile's union with Christ necessarily unites them with each other. Therefore, a man is the peace. Therefore, a man is the peace, just as Micah predicted in Micah chapter 5, verse 5. So Christ himself is the peace between Jewish and Gentile believers, having made the two groups one and having torn down the wall of hostility. So thus, you can say that another aspect of Christ's work might be called demolition. Now, this wall isn't a literal wall, of course, but the invisible barrier set up by, mosa by the Mosaic law of commandments contained in the ordinance, ordinances which separated the people of Israel from the nations. Now, this has often been illustrated by the wall which restricted non-Jews to the court of the Gentiles in the temple area. Now, I, I haven't been there, but I've been told that on the wall there, there's a no trespassing signs which read, let no one of any other nation come within the fence and barrier around the holy place. Whoever's caught doing so will himself be responsible for the fact that his death will ensure. Now, in verses 15 and 16, Paul then described how and why this enmity, the separation came to an end. See, the animosity between believing Jews and Gentiles ceased because by Christ's blood or Christ's death, he rendered the law, he rendered the law inoperative in believers' lives. Jews and Gentiles were enemies because the former sought to keep the law with its commandments and regulations, whereas Gentiles were unconcerned, unconcerned about them. And so the difference was like a barrier between them. But now that the law is inoperative, Jewish and Gentile hostility is gone. Now Christ had two purposes for ending the hostility. The first purpose was to create in himself one new man from two, resulting in peace. This new man, or new humanity, is also called this one body, there in verse 16, or also called this one body. In verse 16, it's, it's the church. In the church, Gentiles do not become Jews, nor Jews become Gentiles. Instead, believing Jews and Gentiles become, what? Become Christians. A whole new single entity. Christ's second purpose in destroying the enmity was to reconcile both Jewish and Gentile believers to himself in one body. This reconciliation was accomplished through the cross by which Christ killed, was killed or put to death, uh, by which Christ killed or put to death the enmity between people and God. Though he was put to death, he in turn put to death the Jewish Gentile hostility. Now in verse 14, the reconciliation between Jewish and Gentile believers. And in verse 16, the reconciliation is between people and God. Reconciliation. 
removal of enmity between man and God is mentioned elsewhere by Paul. It's mentioned in Romans 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 1, and so on. Next, the announcement of peace is given in verses 17 and 18. Now, verse 17 begins in the Greek with and. This links verses 17 with verse 14. So not only is Christ our peace, but he also proclaimed peace. Now, when did Christ do this? Certainly, this refers to the preaching of peace by the apostles rather than Christ himself, because Christ preached almost entirely to Jews. Also, the peace that was preached was on a basis of Christ's death rather than during his life on earth. Peace is supplied both to those who were far away, that is Gentiles, and those who were near, namely Jews. As a result of this message of peace, both Jewish and and Gentile believers have access to God, the Father, by one spirit. Now, access, that word access can mean introduction in the sense that Christ is a believer's introduction to the Father. It seems better to understand that Christ gives believers access to God the Father, through the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Christ's death, because of Christ's death on the cross. And four ways, verses 14 through eight, in verses 14 uh, through 18, Paul emphasized that the two, Jew and Gentile, have been united. The two are made one there in verse 14. One new man is created out of the two, in verse 15. In this one body, both are reconciled, verse 16. And number four, both have access by one spirit, in verse 18. Nothing could be clearer than the fact that this one union replaces that enmity. Uh, Having stated and explained the union of Jewish and Gentile believers, Paul then described the consequences of that union in verses 19 through 22. Verse 19, So then you, that is, Gentile believers, are no longer foreigners and strangers. Believing Gentiles become fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. You become a part of the company of the redeemed of all ages, beginning with Adam. However, this doesn't mean that the church inherits the blessings promised to Israel. I'm not talking about replacement theology. And that we got to, again, be careful about that type of theology, which states that the Israel, that, that the church has replaced Israel and his promises and blessings for them. Okay, so there are three reasons for this. In the context, Paul was discussing the one new man, the one new body. This doesn't mean that Gentiles, Gentiles, again, are incorporated into Israel, but many, but that believing Jews and Gentiles are incorporated into one humanity. Number two, Paul specifically stated that Gentiles are incorporated with God's people and are in God's household. He did not use the word Israel. If Paul meant the church became Israel, he would have named both groups as he did in verse 11, but he didn't. And number three, well, number three, he explained in verse 20 that this new relationship is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the cornerstone. Now, this began on the day of Pentecost, not in the Old Testament, but there being incorporated with Jewish believers into one new man, distinctly began when the church came into being at Pentecost. And so Paul describes the church as a great building, a holy temple 
in which God dwells. This figure of God dwelling in a temple comes from the Old Testament. Paul wrote of the building's foundation there in verse 20, formation in verse 21, and function in verse 22. So now I want to get into each one of those. Formation, the for, I mean the foundation of the building first. The reason Gentile believers are fellow citizens is that they were built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The prophets are of the New Testament era, not the Old Testament. These men received the revelation of the mystery of the church in the present age, which had been hidden in days past, that is, in the Old Testament times. Uh, the words there could be translated, the foundation when, which consists of the apostles and prophets. Stick with me here. Furthermore, this fits with Paul's statement that, G, that Christ Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. That is, he is part of the foundation. In ancient practices, the chief cornerstone was carefully placed. It was crucial because the entire building was lined up with it. The church's foundation, that is the apostles and prophets, needed to be correctly aligned, to be correctly aligned with Christ. All other believers are built on that foundation, measuring their lives with Christ. Paul then discussed the formation of the building. In Christ, the whole building being put together, the structure grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This indicates that the church is a living, a living and growing organism as new believers are included in this temple superstructure. In other words, both Jewish and Gentile believers are being joined together into this one organism labeled a holy temple. And lastly, in verse 22, Paul discussed the function of the temple. God places individual believers into the structure. Thus, it is being built together. And the goal of this temple is for God's dwelling in the spirit in the sorry in the spirit in the old testament God's glory was in the temple which represented his presence with the people in the church age in this age God dwells in his new temple which which is constructed not from inanimate materials not of wood and stone and hay and you know, stucco and you know, everything, that you see, everything that you see here that this building is made out of. No, his temple is composed of all Jewish and Gentile believers. That's the church, my friends. All true Gentile and Jewish believers. Those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The church. Also, did you notice that the ministry of each of the person, persons of the Trinity, of the Godhead, is in, a connection, in, in connection with the church? In him, that is Christ. It's through union with him that we are built into this temple. God's dwelling. This temple is the, throne, is the home of God the Father on earth, in the Spirit. It's in the person of the Holy Spirit that God indwells the church. So let me reiterate that in Him, in Christ, God's dwelling in the Spirit. The Holy Trinity, the Godhead is here among us in the church. Just to quickly sum up these verses that we just covered, Paul has shown that through 
the Gentiles, that though the Gentiles were formerly outside of God's household, they are now a new man with Jewish believers. This new entity is like a temple that is structured on the apostles and prophets with Christ being the chief cornerstone. It's indwelt by God through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we look now over this entire chapter that we covered, you can't help but to praise God for what He, in His grace, has done for sinners. Through Christ, He has raised us from the dead and seated us on the throne. He has reconciled us and set us into His temple. Neither spiritual death nor spiritual distance can defeat God's grace. But He hasn't only saved us individually, He has also made us a part of His church collectively. Friends, if you're a believer here today, what tremendous privilege it is to be part of God's eternal program. Isn't it? Isn't it wonderful? This leads to two practical applications. As we now, as I now close, start to close this study. First, Let me ask this question. Have you personally experienced the grace of God? Are you spiritually dead? Are you distant from God? Or have you trusted Christ and received that eternal life that only He can give? Now, if you're not sure of your spiritual position, I urge you. I urge you today to turn to Christ by faith and trust Him. Like the nation of Israel, you may have been been given many spiritual privileges only to reject the God who gave them. Or like the Gentiles, you may have turned away from God and lived deliberately in sin and disobedience. In either case, As it says in Romans chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if that's you, call on Christ. Trust in Jesus. Surrender your life to him, and he will save you. If that's something you'd like to do at the end here, I will lead you in a prayer to do that. But second, now, Second thing, second practical application. If you're a true believer in Christ, are you helping others to trust in Him? You've been raised from the dead. Do you walk in newness of life? Do you share this good news of eternal life with those on the outside? Those who have no hope, those who have been, are separated, those who just are in the darkness. You, my friends, believers, my, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you are no longer at enmity with God. But are you spreading the good news of peace with God, with those who are still fighting him? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, died to make reconcile, reconciliation possible. You and I must live to make the message of reconciliation personal. We must live to make the message of reconciliation personal. God has given, us, given to us the ministry of recon- reconciliation, it says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. We, as believers, are his ambassadors. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus told us this. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall, be, they shall be called the children of God. A missionary was preaching in the village market, and some of the people were laughing at him because he wasn't, he wasn't, very, he wasn't a very handsome man. He took it for a time, and then he said to the crowd, It is true that I don't have beautiful hair, for I am almost bald, nor do I have beautiful teeth, for they really, for they really, uh, they are really not mine. They are made by the dentist. I don't have a beautiful face, nor can I afford beautiful clothes. But this I know, I have beautiful feet. And he quoted the verse from Isaiah, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. So I ask each and every single one of you, the church, do you have beautiful feet? Do you have beautiful feet to share the gospel wherever you're at? to share the good news wherever you may be, especially to, to those that you care and love about are outside of these promises that haven't yet received the grace of God, that haven't been showered with God's wonderful blessings and and just soak in them and appreciate them. So many lost people out there. Billions of people. Your heart should ache for them, for those who are lost. Jesus Christ's heart ached, his heart ached for, for humanity because he knew they were lost. And he knew there was only one way they can be saved, to reconcile humanity with God. And that's to die for them on the, on the cross. Yes, it's true that unsaved sinners are on their way to hell. But they must see it. They must see their condition. And they can't see that if Christ isn't preached first. So again, I ask you, church, my brothers and sisters, do you have beautiful feet? I want to end now by speaking to those who see your need for a Savior, who want that reconciliation with God, and understand now that you need Jesus. If you're desperately wanting that reconciliation, if you understand now that you want to be reconciled with God and I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. It's not hard. It's very, very simple. But you must be sincere about it. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I readily admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I truly now believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I turn from my sins. I repent. And now look to you and you alone. I confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for, for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my newborn again life 
so that I may be now grafted into the organism now, this living organism, the, the church. I may be, so I can help it grow, Lord, and you can help me grow. I love you so much, Jesus. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, please reach out to us. We want to hear about it and I'd like to help you in your next steps. I want to thank you for joining us, and I just ask that you share this message. Uh, put it out there, and who knows? You know, someone, else, someone else's life may change uh, radically as a result. Hope you have a great week. Uh, next week we'll be here as we continue on with Ephesians chapter 3. Um, let us know again if there's anything we can do for you, pray for you. Um, but in the meantime, have a great week. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.